Okay, yeah. So welcome to this session. This is a following up session from the plenary we had on maps uh, yesterday. So we see that uh, maps is less used than the other analytic apps. At the same time, there is a clear change. I see many more maps now on the presentations at this conference than I've seen in previous years. So there is a change for sure. Uh, there is, we have spent quite a lot of time on improving the maps app and what you can do. Uh, and we believe that the, the, we need to focus more on the capacity building. So people have uh, not started to use the maps app in the same uh, manner as with the other analytics apps. So we're going to have, on this session, we are mainly focusing on how to build capacity. Uh, so Nora from HISP South Africa, where we arranged the last uh, DHS2 Maps Academy, now in May, will present some findings from that academy. Um, and then I will present some briefly some useful resources and also talk about the community of practice where we would like to continue this discussion after this conference. And then hopefully we'll have time for, for some questions and feedback. But then I hand over to you, Nora. Okay, so the first question is that why are maps so underutilized? And to be very honest, I must tell you that it took me a long time before I plucked up the courage to ask somebody, how do I make a map? And I've been using DHIS for so long. I think all the buttons scared me, but once I knew, there's been no stopping me. Everything must go into a map. Um, so out of the fact that we, and maps are one of the most powerful visualization tools. So out of that says, we need to have an academy where we can impart this enthusiasm. So we want to talk about what we've learned from quite a few level two academies and not just the maps academy. Capacity doesn't stick around for very long if you don't use it. If you don't lose what you've used, what you have learned, you forget it very easy. And we, the forgetting curve is very true. Just because you know how to do something doesn't mean that you are going to do it. There's also the willingness to do something. It's easier to do nothing. And we find that in a in uh, a lot of health settings. We just go with the flow. Um, when you send out an invitation for people to attend a training, you end up with lots of people that make you wonder why they are there. Uh, and it's a big issue because the people you want don't always get there. So, if we want to upgrade our Maps Academy and make it more exciting, what do we think we need to do? Well, the first one is we need the correct people. We need the people who need to be there. We need technical map experts there, program staff. And this is one of the, the, the academies where you've got to have the program people because it's no good making maps in a vacuum. You need the HMIS leadership so that they can understand the role of maps and promote them and make sure that you've got the proper printers for printing maps. We attempted to select the most um, appropriate team configuration. We had, I think at one stage, 135 people said yes, they'd come. And then we looked at them and said, okay, who do we think should really be here and who should we not be here? We had two themes. We had a technical theme and we had a data use theme. And so before the academy started, we went through what people said their job was and we allocated them. So it was no self-selection when you arrived on, oh, I think I'd like to go here. We in actual fact had two people who asked for change, which we then allowed, but people were happy to do that. Everybody 
had to work in their country team. We did have a few moans about that, but it was to develop capacity and support each other. And this is a list of the countries that were there. 12, I think we were quite happy with that uh, eventual number. One of the more interesting aspects was that we wanted them to do a self-paced online course. And for many, many academies, the instructions are complete this course before you arrive. Um, I think all academy leaders will tell you that's just wishful thinking. But by some miracle, we got 38 of them to finish. It started and didn't finish. And the course is actually still available online if you are interested to do it. I think it takes about an hour to two hours self-paced online. And one of the reasons we think for the completion was we kept on sending follow-up emails. You've started, but you haven't finished. Um, what, you know, is there something you stuck with? During the academy, we told the countries that they had to come with their own training database with strict instructions about what that database had to look like. Only one country said they had an offline version, but everybody arrived with their own databases and nobody else worked on their database except them. And so I think it was their database, they could do things we weren't interested in it as such. Um, lots of emails, checking, following up on them. And so part of it was that the countries would then have a plan on how to use the products they had learned and that the planning started during the academy and that we would provide follow up and support to them. We then had a fun activity with Tracker and GIS. And it was meeting the demand for ice cream in Seapoint, South Africa, or in Cape Town. So uh, normally you would do this with sort of looking for population, but that didn't work in that area. And so, but what we did have in that area were lots of ice cream shops. And we gave them a map and they had to go and find the ice cream shop and match the name of the shop to the location. And we, Scott set up tracker and Scott, if I make any mistakes, please help me out. So this, the red dot, in the middle is the hotel. The other dots are the ice cream, ice cream shops. It's a very highly densely, highly densely populated area. And you can see there's the sea. And so these were the ice cream shops. So other contextual data to help understand why there would be a demand for ice cream was the population. So we looked at the estimated population where the ice cream shops were. Ah, a question for those of you who were at the plenary yesterday morning. What are we looking at? 100 meters by 100 meters square. What is that? I'm going to demand a refund from all of you. <laughs> it's a gridded population. Do you remember that? The gridded population, 100 meters by 100 meters square in the population figure. And will you ever forget the gridded population? No, <laughs> I have achieved my wish. Then we had an ice cream need index. The closer you were to the sea, the more you needed ice cream. <laughs> and then we took the demand for ice cream, the population over the ice cream needed. And so the darker the color, obviously, the higher the demand for ice cream with the population. So this was a fun activity, and they so enjoyed that. So then we said, 
where would you locate an additional ice cream shop in Sea Point? And so this is the, the, the context is you have a population. Where do you need to put your next health facility? So they had to go to demo dhis 2org ice cream. And in the capture app, they had to open that. So this was <laughs> the ice cream shop hunting. So the instructions were you had to take a photograph. And you can see there was lots of fun. And everybody had to appear in the picture. The other thing about the success of the academy was base it around actual le use, learn by doing. And yesterday, Sylvia put up a very nice poster of the Lesotho who won. But this is what the poster actually looked like. Sylvia gave you the sanitized pretty version. And this is where the instructions about what they had to do and what they eventually gave us. And they were to work with their partners to base it around actual use. Did they want to use this for vaccination, disease surveillance, population mapping? And so the outcome of the MAPS Academy was a country poster using a map and any other data visualization, visualizations and text. We have maps, we have a chart, we have a pivot table, uh, we have a, a, I think it's the borders, maternal and neonatal. So this is what they created for us. And every country did something similar. And then we had a use case bazaar. And these are just some of the examples of the posters that were presented. We also had the Uganda one, um, but this is what it actually looked like. So, and part of that is that we had printers on site in color so that they could print whatever they wanted and have something worthwhile to take home. Then Mentimeter gave us some feedback. Um, I've only put in two of these. Uh, do you intend to use and meet my expectations? We had some other feedbacks which were very strange to us. So I've been very nice to us and not put them in. But we think it could have been a language problem because we had people from Burundi, which is Francophone, and people from Eritrea. And maybe they didn't quite fully understand, but this is yeah, what we got. Then you need to support with online learning. Some of us have just been next door on um, the HISP training capacity, uh, discussing, uh, you know, how do we do capacity building? You've got to share the skills and you've got to have refresher training. And this is something that has, is starting to come through. You need to do these things. Then we're going to follow up with the participants. Are they using their products and their skills or have we wasted our time and money? We also need to find out if maps are available at the lowest level, maps that they create. And part of that was the learning about the population and the catchment population and the building elevation so that maps could be made at lowest levels. Then to start to talk to us about what's changed about the maps you've created or how you've used them. And is there anything else that you want us to do with the maps or any other support that is required? We've worked very hard at trying to create a, a discussion with them. And to our great happiness, less than two weeks after the course, we got this, these pictures from Zambia. We didn't ask for them. I think you saw them yesterday. They just arrived to show us that they had learned something. I mean, you should have seen the smile on our faces. Forget about their faces. And this arrived last night. Again, not solicited. Someone showing Tokazili Banda, the senior health information officer, central province Zambia, just sent Sylvia this picture to show what she has now got on her office wall 
and there are maps there. Previously, there would never have been maps. And this is the exciting bit about this, is that we're actually seeing proof of people using what we've been teaching them. One of the things we also did was we spent time with the different learning materials. Um, and time was dedicated. Now, previously, traditionally, um, you know, at the last minute, right, we, we, we've given you half an hour before closing of uh, the ceremony. No, you can only have five minutes, you know, that, but we actually dedicated time to talk about these things. Kenya, we know, is using Moodle and other countries, so to help build the capacity of people um, for, the, for using Moodle in countries that are using it. And the DHIS2 training app, that won the best app two years ago, Scott, am I right? From ICT and the WHO was shown as a mechanism to replicate training material. You put it in a small video and you can replicate things. So people were shown how these things can be done. Then I just want to mention a few things about what HISP South Africa has done with um, capacity building. And I'm presenting on part of my team of Sandy and Lynn and Sponky, um, who can't be here. So the goal of the capacity building team to, is to provide interactive and appropriate content that's accessible and engaging and provides value to our clients. And our audience is people who are busy. What we have is every single project we do, there is a capacity building section. That may be the writing of the manual, the production of, the vi of a video, or something like that. But capacity building is built into every project. These are some of the things that we offer online, templates, face-to-face, -face, videos, customized, whatever's available. This is some of our specifically DHIS2 training, and that is online self-paced or online instruction instructor-led or face-to-face. -face. We found that the online self-paced has not got a good take up. Online instructor-led, we discovered huge problems with people trying to connect people onto Zoom. You'd spend the first hour of the training trying to make sure that everybody had got the Zoom working. Um, and then they drop off and have to link in again. Really, a lot of the time for the online instructor-led was dealing with problems. And face-to-face, -face, as we all know, is very nice. Everybody wants it, but it's very expensive. Then HISP South Africa has done a huge amount of work with the human resource information system. Um, gathering information is a very big project. And so very specific courses were developed for the RHIS. Data introduction, data quality and use, coaches of change management, because the, the RHIS talks about changing things and you have to deal with the elephant in the room called change management. So actual courses on these things. And of course, TOT or uh, the try teach the trainer to able the continuation of training in provinces and people were selected and tasked to train down to facility level. For the MAPS Academy course, we had sponsorship for staff from the Ministry of Health in South Africa. And one of the criteria for being successful and getting the sponsorship was, what training had you done to cascade down your knowledge? So in other words, a, a big emphasis on HRI, uh, on continuation and cascades, cascading down. Ah. Oh. How do we know if the training is effective? Exceptionally difficult. The learning, pre and post, uh, reaction, engagement with participant feedback, behavior, um, self-assessment surveys delivered post-training after a predetermined time. But the impact of your training is the hardest one to measure. 
outcomes that occurred occurred as a bunch as a result of the training. Very, very difficult to measure that. Uh, the top five things that the participants liked is charts and pivots, practicals. They loved maps and wanted to do more maps, videos, analyzing data. So, you know, we found out what the participants like, um, but unfortunately, you have to do other things as well. For map training, before the map app was developed, um, the online course, his SA provided training on create and export pivots to shape files, background understanding of maps, linking Excel tables from DHIS to, to GIS, uh, uh, to QGIS, and now it's circled around. Now you move layers from DHIS map into QGIS. So, you know, big steps forward. Our map training is also included in all of our basic training. And these are some of the things that we use for the MAPS training. The Moodle platform, in case anybody needs an address for the Moodle platform. And if we want to look at more or different academies, it must be disease specific with both program and technical staff. Um, and that I think was part of the the success of this academy is that we had the two groups of people. And the split was more or less 50-50, which was actually very interesting as well. Micro planning and micro planning is becoming the new hot buzzword. So we need some micro planning. And I hand over. Thank you, Nora. Uh, I will present a few resources that you can use to build capacity. Uh, first, I want to broaden the perspective a little bit. We often talk about maps, uh, but maps are, uh, operates within the bigger ecosystem of a GIS system. Uh, so this is a common definition from this one is from National Geographic. Uh, that is a system for both capturing, storing, checking and displaying data. And the goal is to understand patterns and see see relationships. And you have this special possibility with a map is that you can add multiple layers on top of each other and also analyze if there are connections in between them. For example, as we showed yesterday, that you can use your our unit boundaries and with a population layer and then calculate the population within. So G, this is GIS very effective. So I tried to see the different parts of the GIS system, how they, that applies to DHS2. So maps is only one part of it. So to capture data, we have also seen the example with the, with the ice creams that you can use the, the Android capture app to capture coordinates. There is also the tracker capture app and a data entry app. So just to, this is important, not only thinking about the maps, because if you don't have data, good data, quality data, the correct coordinates into the system, there is not much use of the maps at the other end. So it's important to, full, to focus on the full flow. And then we also have the import export app that you use to import geometries. Uh, I will also show you later on that you can also use it to import data from the Google Earth engine into your system. Uh, and we also have apps from the community. So this one I was also mentioning yesterday, this is the micro planning app, which can be used to create catchment areas. So they do a lot of processing behind the scenes. It's not supported for every country. It's possible to reach out for them and ask if they can add support for your country. But uh, this is just show an example. And here they could be, hopefully we're trying to make this an open system. So that hopefully there will be even more apps allowing you to get data into DHS2. Then as the core, it's, you have the API, and then there is a full-fledged uh, GIS database in the system. So all the installations you have, it's, a, it's called PostGIS. I won't talk about it, but just so you know, there is a, it's a proper GIS database uh, already within your system. So we use some of that functionality to support the Maps app, for example. And then uh, checking is also part of the GIS definition. Unfortunately, we don't have an app yet that checks for coordinates. We should definitely have that and it's planned. 
uh, I guess you have seen that by yourself, but when you look at the map, you see that these coordinates but definitely be wrong. And even now, sometimes out of your country. And there are possible to make this automatically to detect that your coordinates are at least within your org units. So we will look into that. And then we have the maps app. And also for the maps app, we are, we are three here from the analytic teams. We try to, to work hard, but the, our team is very small. We will never ever be able to cover all your use cases. So that's why often to do more advanced spatial analysis, combine different data sets, you will need to move into another GIS program. And we don't aim to support all use cases in the HS2 maps. So these are important to learn as well if you want to go more advanced. And then uh, for analysis, so far we have the example with the Earth Engine. Hopefully there might be more in the future that there are sort of re repositories with good data and also processing capabilities that we can plug into the system. So that will be the focusing for the upcoming uh, versions next. So yeah, I just talked about these layers yesterday. I just want to mention this before you had to sign up with Google and it was a lengthy process. No, we are allowed to do this for you. Uh, so it's just to send an email. We should ask your system administrator to send an email to maps at dhs2.org if you want to have access to these layers. We will create a credential file, send it back, and this needs to just be placed at a location on the, your web server. And that's all you need to do. It should always work when you upgrade later on. It's just a one-time operation. So it should be done within a few minutes. So I hope from after this academy, many more requests for, for uh, getting this access. Next. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned this micro planning app. You find that in the app hub. So search for the for micro planning. This is just how easy it operates. You select your country. So you need to check if your country is already supported. Um, and then you select an area or the full country. You name it. For example, catchment areas for this for bow, and then you can you can select the, your facility level here, and then that will upload the location of your facilities to their server. It will automatically generate the catchment areas. They also have an editing tool which is not included in this app. This is the simplified version, so you can also log into the Crosscut website. I added it here. And you can add it manually. Add it if you see this is totally wrong. The cat, the border catchment uh, border should be here, not here. You can manually edit it on the map, and then do a new import into the system. So please try this out and reach out either to us or to to Crosscut if if this is something useful or something you you miss. Next. Uh, we this was released for two thirty nine. Uh, we saw you had this, um, I demoed the population data yesterday. We, we want to make a, a strong distinction between the population data you have in your own system that you use for your indicators and denominators and this world pop data. But in case, oops, hope it went fine. <laughs> uh, in case you would like to use this data in addition to the population data you already have as a, a, an alternative denominator, you, we, you know how to have the possibility to import the population data for your own district, even the catchment areas you defined, and into a data element in DHIS2. And then it's not only accessible in the Maps app, but it will also be accessible in the other analytics apps, in, in pivots or on tables and charts. So just so you know, you have that possibility and you are under full control how you would like to use this. Next. Um, yeah, as I said, Maps app, we will, Maps app should be the main tool you use when you want to look at your own DHS2 data. And if it's not, if you feel you want to look at your only your own data and you need to move into another GIS program, please give us feedback because then we are not covering all of your needs. But that should be the prime primary goal for the Maps app. 
Uh, and we also tried when you when you move into QIS, you will see tons of buttons, menus, and and these quite complex tools. So we are trying to keep the maps up very simple. So that should also be it's it's main for used by all like program managers and all. Not you don't need to ask a technical person to create a map for you when using the DHS2 maps. And this is also important because you should have direct access to look at your own data for your programs. But then uh, to do more advanced things, you will, would need to use another GIS program. Often we talk about QGIS as an open source free alternative and ArcGIS as a commercial software uh, with also lots of capabilities. Sometimes ArcGIS is already su supported by the government, for example, they have licenses. So often my recommendation is to use ArcGIS if it's already with if the ministry is already, for example, having access and there are people trained and know how to use it. Uh, it would be nice to sort of bridge the gap between DHS2 and ArcGIS. If not, I often would suggest to support with, to start with QGIS. It's a free download, free resource. There is a big community, very easy to find, uh, find uh, information online. Um, and we also have some material uh, for QGIS, which I will so show soon. Uh, one th distinction with ArcGIS is also like a big online tool, re repository processing capabilities, while QGIS is pure desktop based. So that has pros and cons. If you are in a low bandwidth uh, area, uh, QGIS might work just working locally. Uh, next. Uh, this is just an example of how to uh, show it yesterday, but here is actually the the tree to working together. So the DHS2 maps, you can easily download data here for all your layers. This one is from uh, the organization Grid Tree Settlement Extents. They, they are actually running ArcGIS online. So from here as well, you can easily download data and then it's just now very QGIS has improved greatly in the last few years. It's just to drag those two files into the QGIS window, and then uh, you can overlay the two layers. And again, here look for if there are settlements without a health facility, for example. But if you go one back, you will see the number of buttons here in QGIS. So we don't want to overwhelm you with this, but here you have all, every possible possibilities, but it comes with a higher learning costs. Next. Uh, and also sh I showed the printing functionality. We have greatly improved in 240. I know that many of you are not yet on 240 and it might still take some time. I al already see on the Academy that people use QIS to make pretty printed maps. So just know that the capacity in QAS is, is great to, to make the map layout that you like. Next. So we have collected some resources that you can use from what we have previously done. So there are some, this I will I have shared on the community of practice. I will show you where, so you will have all the links. Uh, there are some guides this is the official maps uh, documentation and then there are also some material we have for the level one academy on the analytics tools then i especially recommend to have a look at these uh, videos here very short giving you a nice introduction uh, then there are some uh, more lengthy i think i'm in a few of them a bit stressed trying to <laughs> go through the all the features so you can check if it's something for you uh, and then next slides we also have some here for qgis as i said the population data we are focusing quite a bit on um, world pop is having more detailed data on their website for specific countries we have the best data they have for the all the uh, for with the global coverage so if you would like to try to make the same exercise of calculating the population within an org unit, for example, you can have these. There are a series of short boundaries showing you all uh, short videos showing you all the steps for how to do it. Uh, and I even have an extra here, with, so you can see within org units within a buffer around the health facility if you don't have catchment areas, and even within a walking and driving distance from a health facility. So please have a look at this. 
And then there are some other resources here for QGIS and also for ArcGIS. I think this was the last. No. No. Yes, the community of practice. Uh, we would like to have the communication around maps on the community of practice. So if you have any issues, don't reach out to me or us directly. Please use the community of practice, but we will monitor it and follow up. But then people are wondering about the same issues. So it's much better to have the discussion going on there. Uh, there has We have added a new maps category here. So under implementation, you will find maps. And I've posted all the resources I just presented uh, just now before the session here. So do you find that on the maps category? So please have a look. Next, I think that's, yeah. So please use community of practice. Ask it not only about technical things, also about how to learn. Do you know if, uh, do you, if we have learning material for some things you need? And so on. It's we are open for for all kind of of uh, of questions, and we we are here for you. So we will try to help as best as best as we can. So thank you. Uh, are there any questions for both me and and Nora about capacity building? There was two here in the middle. Mm. My name is Tony Iha, work for Art Associate. And this is not a capacity building question, but a community of practice question. Allow me to post it here just in case there's anyone who's experienced it. And it's to do with the capture of the of, of the map because there's an image you show the different the different ways in which a uh, GPS or something can be captured uh, areas. And so this particular one is for I didn't see the one for capturing maps using the web API. And it happens that whenever you use the API, the GPS are flipped. So it's something that is to the community if anyone has experienced that and if there was an, a way in which they've gone around, maybe I'll be happy to hear later on. So the, the latitude, the latitude is flipped. Yeah, we use the API. Mm -hmm. I I think that would be it sounds like a bug if that it has happening while you're using the API or and uh, and also we have tried now to be more specific. It used to be one coordinate field often and then people were Messed up. They didn't know if it should put longitude or latitude first. So now it's often two fields in the entry forms, but there might still be some areas where we still haven't implemented that. So if you know a specific API request where this is happening, uh, please tell us, and we will. If it's a bug, we will fix it for sure. Mm. Uh, behind you. Uh, my name is Diego. I'm with the African Leaders Malaria Alliance, Alma. Uh, I had a question around the population projections. I, I'm very excited about it, but we all know populations tend to be very political and controversial sometimes. My first question is, when you import the, the population projections from the Google Earth engine, will that then create population data elements that will apply to all of your indicators or it, it gets... It's inside the maps app and it stays there. So, yeah, so there are two ways you can only when you look at it in the maps app, it will only stay in the maps app. It will not influence anything else on the on your DHS, to instance. If you use the import export app, it will you also need to create a data element for to import that one in, and you are in full control of that data element. So you typically you you won't use the same data element as you already use as a denominator for sure, and then overwrite that one. And the second part is: Are there any good examples of countries that have, you know, massively adopted the, the population estimates as opposed to their census numbers? Um, and are there any good resources for us if we want to, you know, sell this concept to countries? Do you have anything that speaks to maybe the accuracy of, of this these projections? Mm. I, w I would. Could you answer this one? Uh, 
Um, yeah. Can I use this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's a good question. Um, there are several countries who have adopted the population um, models. There um, are some countries where. Okay, so let, let me restart. So there's the global population layer that you can download from WorldPop today, um, and that you can get it like in, in different ways, constrained, unconstrained, UN-adjusted, non-adjusted, and so on and so forth. There are other models that WorldPop, um, a lot of times through grid three, um, will create together with the stats office. Um, and in many areas where there's conflict, for example, if there is a census, there will be areas where they will use the model to predict populations in those areas. And those have been accepted in various countries. Um, we've also seen, um, and I, I might not name countries, <laughs> um, but we've also seen that ministries of health will, um, especially with some of the more bespoke models, which use survey data um, or even census cartography data to recreate um, the, the the population, ministries of health will use it, while the stats office does not. So they may use it for campaign planning or micro planning even, um, but it's it won't go into the DHIS two and will be reported upwards. Uh, I'm Absalom uh, Mamrima from Malawi. Uh, I just want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I think that was on Monday. My colleague from Malawi uh, asked on how uh, we can uh, come up with a, a micro planning uh, in a situation where we have uh, disparities in terms of uh, population. And I believe. Uh, from what you have presented, uh, it has uh, ignited us to have advocacy. If there's possibility to uh, for the academies and if uh, micro planning is part of uh, uh, the academy that advocacy, we may need to have uh, much, uh, we can say orientation or maybe uh, training so that we can actually be able to utilize it at its fullest. So I, I don't know if there's that uh, inclusion, the academics for the upcoming uh, process. Thank you. Maybe some of you would like to answer, but it's a good question. Maps is so broad and you can use it so for so many use cases. So I think there is a need for more specific academies or training for example, within the micro planning fields of how we can use it. Um, yeah, and I think the, not just the maps is broad, but the micro planning is broad. Um, a lot of the micro planning tools are very large. So it's not just maps. Um, it's also sometimes misleading. We now have a lot of tools that call themselves micro planning tools and they're not. Um, so the tool that you saw today by Crosscut is not really a micro planning tool it's a catchment area delineation tool. Yeah, that's very different. So we have to be very careful um, when we say, you know, making micro planning maps, that's not your micro plan. There's so much that goes into micro planning, but right now facilities are largely using hand-drawn maps um, and that creates gaps um, and overlaps as well in the planning process. Um, so the catchment areas and the delineation is really, really important. And also having those, those distances um, that are very clear and accurate in, in a map that's uh, you know generated by the Maps app or QGIS or ArcGIS. Um, so, so we could start by just replacing the hand-drawn map and how that is used with a GIS generated map. And that's happening in countries already. Um, and we're seeing that facilities like to use both at the beginning. So they're still kind of checking their hand-drawn maps and, and, and then looking at the GIS map and, and seeing the, then also seeing the benefits. Um, but I think I said this yesterday that catchment mapping and getting that right and having the facilities accept that catchment area um, is going to be very, very important. Any more questions? Thank you for the presentation, uh, presentations on the maps um, for this week. Um, 
I know this is mostly about capacity. Just thinking, of, I guess, a little bit about the roadmap for next steps of what might be available in coming versions. And I guess in, with the continuous rollout in mind in particular um, for this app is right now the ability to import directly the population and population age group is available within the import export. Is it also uh, in the future going to be available also for the climate uh, humidity, um, heat, and everything else is also available currently just visually on the maps. And apologies, we've already covered this. <laughs> I see you smiling as maybe you have. No, it's uh, as we discussed yesterday. Also, there might be a big climate and health project coming. Okay. Um, I I envision because right now you have this sort of hard coded external layers in the maps app, and I feel that's a limitation. You need to go through us and tell us we would like to have this and this data. I think this should be up to the maintainer system administrator of the DHS2 instance to add whatever external data they would like. So, so that's on the roadmap to try to make this much more flexible. So you can basically decide yourself which external layers you want to provide to all of your users. And then not only Google Earth Engine, that could also be RTIS online or other it may be even, I know for the for the climate data, they also want to support very local data. So they can add also very granular uh, metrological data, for example, to the instance. So, so this is uh, the plan to make it much more flexible. So, so there are no limitations of what data you can, you can add. Mm. Any more? If not, I think but there is a rush always. Oh, we have a break after this one, so we don't need to rush. Yes. <laughs> we can still stop. We have to have a few more minutes. If there are any more questions, if not, we will. And please use the community of practice. Give us feedback if something we're doing right or wrong, some features you are missing, or, or training materials you would like to see. Uh, so please reach out. Okay, thank you.